Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Dark Souls Dissected. With Elden Ring on the horizon, I wanted to review how poise works throughout the Souls games. It's an anti-stagger mechanic that helps prevent the player from flinching when taking a hit, which can be a massive help in many situations. But it's gone through a bunch of iterations, and we're at the point where you can never really know what to expect from poise based on its name alone. You need to look at each game individually to understand what exactly it offers. So today we'll be taking a close look at the poise system of Dark Souls 1. And I can promise that even if you have a pretty in-depth knowledge of it already, there's some obscure details and oddities in here that will probably be new to you. It's going to get a little weird. So even though we're going to focus primarily on Dark Souls 1, I do think it'll be helpful to provide some context first. With this game, we have the origins of Poise for this series. Sort of. It's the first Soulsborne game to have it listed as a stat, as it didn't really exist in Demon's Souls. Heavy armor doesn't prevent you from flinching there. What Demon's Souls did have, however, is what the community refers to as hyper armor. It's a concept that originates elsewhere, and it applies more broadly to a lot of fighting games. But in Demon's Souls, it was a system where certain weapons simply had the ability to prevent stagger during their attack animations. The idea was that some of the heavier weapons are just going to carry through with their attack once you've started them, because they might as well be too heavy to stop. So if you wanted to take hits without staggering in Demon's Souls, it was very context dependent, only working mid-attack with a few weapons. And bear in mind this wasn't a named mechanic or some kind of stat that you could actually see in the menus. To contrast this with Dark Souls 1, Poise is seen in the menus, and it's granted by heavier armor instead of weapons, and it's always on passively. It doesn't matter if you're attacking or standing still, you don't have to do anything for it to work. Before more of the Souls sequels came out, the community developed a pretty rigid set of expectations for how these mechanics are defined. Despite both being anti-stacker mechanics, hyper armor was understood to be this one specific thing from Demon Souls, while Poise from Dark Souls was something completely different. However, as more of these games came out, it became apparent that they didn't have the clear delineation that the community did. From the perspective of the developers, poise just seems like something they might use to refer to pretty much any kind of anti-stagger effect. While I find it helpful to understand the distinction between hyper armor from Demon Souls and poise from Dark Souls 1, the series itself absolutely does not recognize this distinction. Whenever you see a stat like poise pop up in one of these games, there's no way to know exactly what it's going to do based on its name alone. But if you wanted to define it a bit better, I'd say that poise is an umbrella term that might include any combination of hyper armor and what the community sometimes calls passive poise from Dark Souls 1. This might be a bit of an oversimplification, but this is how I'd try to describe the different iterations of poise. Again, Dark Souls 1 had passive poise, Dark Souls 2 used a combination of passive poise and hyper armor, and Dark Souls 3's version of poise was essentially just hyper armor again, for the player character at least. And also, before anyone asks, I realize the terminology for a lot of people can get even more specific with things like hyper armor versus super armor. And this might even get more confusing when we see that poise is referred to as super armor in the data. But this distinction only applies to other games, and you don't have to worry about it here. If you're a fan of fighting games and you have a preconception of what all these different terms are supposed to mean, I would recommend pushing that off to the side when talking about Dark Souls. One thing to look out for is that you might occasionally see hyper armor referred to as active poise in the Souls community, referring to how it only works while you're attacking, but that's about it. Okay, if you're still with me and your eyes haven't completely glazed over with this discussion on terminology, let's finally discuss how it works in Dark Souls 1. Poise is granted to the player by equipping certain pieces of armor, or also the wolf ring. But you'll find that only heavier pieces of armor have poise, creating a trade-off between maneuverability and your ability to soak up hits without reacting. In certain situations, it can be incredibly helpful. Take the Capper Demon, for example. It's a widely reviled boss fight because it takes place in a small cramped room, where it can be difficult to dodge the boss and the dogs at the same time. And for a lot of players, this means dying very quickly and not even getting a chance to learn the boss's moveset. But with sufficient poise, you can shrug off the dog's attacks and avoid the downward spiral that comes with getting stunned right away. Now, it's not that poise always prevents you from getting stunned entirely. There are situations where some attacks are strong enough to normally send you flying backwards. 
And what happens to these is that having enough poise to withstand them means experiencing a more minor stagger, but at least being able to remain on your feet. Poise is often described as being like an extra hidden stamina bar, which is a fairly reasonable way to picture it. When your poise is reduced to zero from an attack, you'll stagger. This throws up a separate flag called Break, which will turn on and change from 0 to 1 during your stagger animation. And if you don't have any poise to begin with, every attack will stagger you, since your poise is already at 0, and so any hit will always break it. How it differs from stamina, though, is that poise in Dark Souls 1 doesn't steadily regenerate. So let's say I have 40 poise, and then an enemy hits me and reduces it to 20. If I were to wait a couple seconds, my poise will still be exactly 20, because it stays perfectly frozen there for a time instead of climbing back up. How its regeneration works is that a timer is triggered each time you take a hit. While the timer is running, your poise remains locked where it is, and if you take another hit, your poise will be reduced again and the timer will start over completely, allowing the same full amount of time for each subsequent hit. But if the timer runs out at any point along the way, your poise instantly refills back to 100%. So whenever a single attack isn't enough to break something's poise, you'll have to keep attacking within a certain window of time in order to continue chipping away at it. Oh, and it also instantly refills any time it breaks as well. The length of the poise timer is 5 seconds by default, though it can be shortened for the player character and other human NPCs so that it can refill faster, and I'll talk more about that later. But bear in mind 5 seconds is the longest it ever takes in Dark Souls 1, and it's this exact amount for almost every enemy that has poise as well. Which brings me to my next point. If you're wondering, yes, a lot of enemies have poise as well. Even though they don't have functioning armor, like the player or NPCs, for them it's just an innate stat that otherwise works in the exact same way. Any attack that drains poise from another player in PvP will drain the same amount of poise from a random enemy. Reduce their poise to zero with an attack, and you'll make them stagger. I know there are people who disliked the poise from Dark Souls 1 because they felt it was overpowered, but instead of trying to make a counter-argument, because in all honesty that's a completely subjective thing, I just want to talk about what I think is its biggest strength here. I think the best part about the passive poise of Dark Souls 1 is how it regenerates. I know that probably seems like such a simple aspect of it, but I truly believe it's the secret linchpin of what makes it as solid as it is. By not having it steadily refill over time, like stamina, and instead locking it and then giving you a window of time to either reduce it further or have it snap back to full, this is what made it very predictable and something that you can reasonably learn and depend on. It's not hard to remember that when I use this weapon and this specific attack, that this enemy is always going to stagger after 3 hits. Both the poise damage values of your weapons and enemy poise are hidden stats that the game doesn't let us see, so this information is obfuscated. But it doesn't take much effort to hit an enemy a few times with your favorite weapon, and walk away with an understanding of how many hits it takes to stagger. This wouldn't work so well if poise refilled like stamina, because then suddenly whether or not you combo 3 attacks quickly, or wait almost 5 full seconds between each attack, that could change how many attacks are needed. This meant that players in Dark Souls 1 had a lot of freedom to attack enemies at a varying pace, while still reasonably being able to rely on poise to break when they expected it to as long as they weren't waiting so long as to let the enemy's poise refill. This is a stark contrast from how it worked in Dark Souls 2. I'm not going to do a deep dive on its poise in this video, but the short version is that it not only refilled steadily there, but it also refilled extremely slowly. It could take well over a minute in some cases. This almost completely undid the reliability of poise that Dark Souls 1 had, and for a long time people actually thought it was heavily bugged. It turns out it wasn't, but before the community figured out what was going on, it felt so unintuitive that people thought it wasn't working consistently. The player base often wondered why a weak attack might break their poise, and why that same attack sometimes wouldn't. A big part of that is just because the players had no idea their poise might have still been partially drained from combat that happened over 20 seconds ago. So the sort of all or nothing approach to regeneration that Dark Souls 1 had was just so much more intuitive. Even without knowing the numbers behind the scenes, players just trusted it more on a subconscious level. So let's take a look at who actually has poise and is able to be staggered. And we're going to go through this list in order from lowest to highest to see who wins Lordran's Tankiest Enemy Award.
But I should mention first that roughly half the bosses in this game don't have poise at all. But rather than being staggerable on every hit, because of course that'd make things too easy, the opposite actually happens and you can think of it like having infinite poise instead. There's a couple levels of safeguards in place, uh, there's a special effect that might nullify a reaction to having their poise broken, on top of some of these enemies just not even having a stacker included in their set of animations. So really the tankiest enemy award should belong to all of the enemies that can't ever be staggered. But where's the fun in that? I want to see who actually has the highest poise. To begin with, we can start with the opposite of what I just described. There are a bunch of lesser enemies that also have zero poise, but unlike the bosses I just mentioned, this means they actually do stagger with every hit, no matter how weak it is. Even just equipping a piece of the thorn set and rolling into them is enough to push them around. This includes enemies like the regular hollows, armored soldiers, demonic foliage, rats, frog rays, and a bunch more. So these are all of the rejects who don't get to participate. They've been sent on the first bus home. Even the Balder Knights don't have any poise, so this gives them an honorable mention as the biggest loser of all. Because their armor is supposed to include poise when worn by the player character. So it's a complete fail from their end. With all that being said, let's begin. Time in last place, we have... Okay, I can't really do an announcer voice, so never mind. Tying in last place, we have the Crow Demon and Maneater Shell. With 30 poise, they're able to withstand a lot of single attacks from smaller weapons. They'll laugh at your daggers and thrusting swords, sometimes taking as many as 6 hits if you're not too handy. They can also withstand every punch from a fist weapon, besides from the jumping attack. And for a lot of your regular, medium-sized weapons, like your straight swords, katanas and spears, etc., 30 is still enough to withstand a single one-handed attack but it's not enough to save them from a two-handed attack. Moving on to the next contestants, we have a six-way tie for 12th place that includes the Channeler, Giant Skeleton, Great Feline, Minor Capper Demon, Serpent Soldier, and Silver Knight. They all have 45 poise, and this allows them to withstand any single attack from mostly every medium-sized weapon. Most halberds also don't make the cut, aside from the Black Knight halberd. You'll generally have to look to the Hammer class to start finding more weapons that can break their poise with a single two-handed attack, but not even all hammers make the cut. And the judges would like to remind everyone that the minor Capper Demon is not to be confused with the boss, as this Capper Demon comes to us from the Demon Runes. Next up we have a two-way tie for 11th place between the Centipede Demon's arm and Centipede Demon's tail, with 60 poise. Oh wait, what's that? There's a secret third contestant alongside them here. It's Priscilla. We couldn't see her because she was invisible. As it turns out, even though she can't be staggered in normal combat, breaking her poise while she's invisible is what makes her visible. Here we have a four-way tie for 10th place between the Dark Wraith, Drake, Mimic, and Skeleton Beast. At 65 poise, they'll withstand a single attack from almost every single greatsword, even when two-handed. But two-handed attacks from most great axes and great hammers still stun these creatures with a single blow. In ninth place, we have a three-way tie between the Black Knight, the Sentinel, and the Gargoyles. With 80 poise, they're able to ignore almost every single attack from the great axes and great hammers now. Users of these weapons will have to get creative and will want to try running attacks to see them staggered with a single hit. And spellcasters will still find success with a lot of the stronger spells. In a shocking upset, in 8th place we have the Chained Prisoner, who also has 80 poise. The previous contestants might be a little upset that he escaped the tie, but the Chained Prisoner had a few tricks up his sleeve. To start with, he's the only creature so far to have a 4 second timer. You have 1 second less between each hit before his poise resets to full, giving him a distinct advantage. And if that wasn't enough, it's possible for him to resist staggering even when you do break his poise. It's not something we'll see from anyone else here. He refuses to budge if his poise is broken by a weaker attack. Watch as a series of R1 attacks breaks his poise, but then does nothing. It's only with an R2 attack from the same weapon that we see any success, because he only allows himself to be staggered by stronger attacks. That could be a whole tangent in and of itself, but the short explanation is that there's a set of parameters relating to something called damage level, and the Chain Prisoner won't bother staggering to lesser damage levels that we could classify as light and super light attacks. 
So even though he's only in 8th place, the Chained Prisoner is also receiving an additional accolade. At this stage, the competition is getting pretty stiff. We have another 3-way tie for 90 poise, and this includes the Chaos Eater, the Sanctuary Guardian, and Dragon Slayer Ornstein. The judges have to be firm on this ranking, and rumor has it that Ornstein isn't happy about this, on the account of some promise to get infinite poise if his best friend dies. But last we checked, Smo's still alive. <laughs> With poise this high, even most two-handed attacks from large weapons aren't going to be enough to break poise in a single attack. You'll have to start looking towards some special attacks that go above and beyond. Though a handful of one-handed strong attacks from certain Ultra Great Swords still stagger these enemies, along with their running attacks. And in 6th place, we have a crowded entry with 8 contestants. We have Andre of Astora, The Butcher, The Giant Undead Rat, Minor Taurus Demon, Vamos the Blacksmith, Gwyn, Gwyndolin, and Pinwheel. It turns out we sent all of his clones away on that first bus, as they don't have any poise, but the boss checks out. I'm not sure if this looks good for Pinwheel or bad for Gwyn, who has surprisingly low poise for a final boss. With 100 poise, these are the last contestants that are unable to withstand the egghead kick attack. And now in 5th place, we have the infested barbarian, the capper demon, and Smo, with 110 poise. Smo isn't making any promises to become unstaggerable if Ornstein dies, and he's perfectly content with the poise he currently has. Smo, do you have anything you'd like to say to Ornstein, who ranked a couple places beneath you? <laughs> <laughs> With 110 poise, these enemies are just barely able to withstand a full spread of Dark Bead without staggering. Though some of them might just die from that, before staggering. Here we have another 4-way tie in 4th place, between the Bone Tower, Crystal Golem, Mushroom Parent, and Taurus Demon. At 120 poise, there's only 3 spells remaining that can stagger these creatures in a single hit. There's Chaos Storm, Gravelord Greatsword Dance, and the Sunlight Spear. And there's also just a few remaining melee attacks that will knock these enemies off balance, the weakest of which are the two-handed strong attacks from certain Ultra Great Swords. Third place we have Knight Artorius, alongside the Golden Crystal Golem, the Heavy Knight, and the Royal Sentinel, with 130 poise. Like Ornstein, Artorius tried to dispute this ranking, but the judges refused to budge. Artorius takes things even further than the Chained Prisoner, and is able to regenerate his poise in a mere two and a half seconds. This is the fastest regeneration in town, it's twice as fast as most of the rest of the competition, and he's the second of only two enemies to modify the timer at all. You'd think that accounting for this advantage might put him in first place, but when he goes to do his whole charge-up attack, he becomes more vulnerable by dropping to 90 poise. In second place, we have... The Massive Souls! Bet you didn't see that coming. With 140 poise, and just like everyone in 3rd place, there are no longer any single spell attacks that can stagger this enemy, unless you're able to get a couple Firestorm Pillars or Gravelord Swords to hit together. There's also one last special attack capable of breaking this amount of poise, which is the Dragon King Great Axe's two-handed R2. And now in 1st place, with 200 poise, we have a three-way tie between the Giant Stone Knight, the Stone Guardian, and the Titanite Demon. From here, Firestorm, Fire Tempest, and Gravelord Sword Dance would need three pillars to hit simultaneously to break their poise in a single attack. And it's only Chaos Storm and the Great Sword Dance that could pull it off with just two pillars. Or if you're an incredible masochist and wanted to try breaking their poise with a dagger's one-handed R1 attack, you'll have to hit them 40 times in a row. Congratulations to our winners! Okay, with that silliness out of the way, I did want to point out a few things that fall outside the box here. Quaylag can be staggered, but it doesn't have anything to do with poise. That's just a special animation that triggers if you can manage to hit her humanoid body, regardless of poise or even how much damage is done. The Iron Golem doesn't use poise either. Its stumbling over has everything to do with how much actual damage has been done to its legs. And similarly, you may find some other context-dependent staggers, like cutting the tail off of an enemy which once again has nothing to do with poise and is just baked into the animation of the tail breaking off. Oh, and the four kings get an honorable mention for being really weird. They have 80 poise. They all have it, even the out-of-bounds damage conduit hiding beneath the arena. But it does nothing at all. 
You can watch it drain and reset, but the four kings don't have a stagger animation. So this is the one unstaggerable enemy that had its poise set higher than zero, which must be an oversight. I have to wonder if there was some miscommunication. I can imagine that one developer felt that because of the way they gang up on you, them being able to stagger is something that should have been in the game, and so they set some poise. But without a stagger animation being available, if this decision was made too late in the development process, they might have just given up on it. If there was any remaining confusion, the amount of poise damage dealt from weapons, spells, or really any kind of attack is a fixed value that's completely independent of how much health is being lost. To demonstrate this, we can make it so that an enemy is set to not lose any health, and we can turn them into an endless punching bag to test their poise. We'll see that their poise still drains regardless of other damage. What this means is that a weapon will always deal the same amount of poise damage, depending on which attacks you use, regardless of its upgrade level. If you're curious how much poise damage a certain attack does, I tested literally every attack you can do in the game and made a complete list on the wiki a few years back. It was a weird rabbit hole to go down and I was able to dig up some pretty obscure stuff. For example, if you hit water with the various lightning spear miracles, it radiates out an AoE of damage. There's also poise damage associated with that, and there are three different tiers of poise damage depending on how close you are to the center of that AoE. I'm not going to go through all of this here, but I figured some viewers might be wondering more about what does the most poise damage. I did mention most of these when ranking the enemies and what they can withstand, but the two-handed R2 of the Dragon King Great Axe comes out in first place, potentially dealing 150 poise damage in a single attack. This is atypical of its class, with no other attack coming nearly that close. This wins on somewhat of a technicality in that the AoE Blast is only set to do 100 poise damage. 100 is already the second highest number available to the player, so that's still very high to begin with. But if the weapon itself makes contact with the enemy, then it deals an additional 50 poise damage on top of that. There are some other melee attacks that can exceed 100 damage, but these are also other multi-stage poise attacks that can come from Ultra Great Swords, which still only do 130 at most when combined. Since 100 comes in second place in terms of raw numbers set in the data, it's worth pointing out the three spells that are in first place, doing 120 poise damage each. I mentioned these earlier as being Chaos Storm, Gravelord Greatsword Dance, and the Sunlight Spear. So this is the highest any single attack is set to, only being outperformed by the Dragon King Great Axe and a few Ultra Greatswords if those land their double poise hits correctly. But when you remember that the first two of these spells and their pillared attacks could hypothetically have two or more hit the same enemy, then it's theoretically possible for them to do 240 poise damage or more if you get incredibly lucky. Well, it's not that hard to get multiple pillars to hit big enemies like the Titanite Demon, but for a variety of reasons that's too complicated to get into here, just know that that's not really a realistic goal for the Gravelord Sword Miracles. It's just not going to happen. The Pyromancy spells are significantly more reliable for that. It's also worth mentioning that the lava left behind by Chaos Storm has its own poise damage value of 5. So even though this enemy only gets hit by a single pillar here, it does take three additional hits from a pool of lava. This increases the poise damage from 120 to 135. So this is another way you can get a little bit more poise damage in from a single attack. The one thing I didn't make a complete list of for the wiki was how much poise damage all of the different enemy attacks do to the player. But skimming through the parameters now, we can learn a few things. An enemy falling on top of you appears to always be set to remove 999 poise, so that's a guaranteed stagger. And the same applies to traps, like the boulder in the tutorial, and the Hellkite Dragon's Fire. There's a good number of weaker enemy attacks that do 20 or less poise damage, and when you bear in mind that the Wolf Ring offers 40 poise with no weight penalty, that makes it a good choice for withstanding them. I often use it to help me out in the Capra Demon fight without any additional poise. It's a little risky in the sense that the dog's attacks do 20 poise damage each, so it only takes two hits to get staggered. But you could easily add on the lightest poise granting armor possible to make the dogs require three hits instead. And then by that point, you're really only thinking about dodging the Capra Demon to get up the stairs. But when in doubt, there's other early game sources of high poise available if you really wanted to go wild with it. In the medium range of typical poise damage, 45 is also a number that comes up pretty often in PvE. 
so giving yourself another 6 poise on top of the wolf ring can help you withstand a bunch more stuff. And it's by no means the highest amount of poise damage an enemy can do, but on the upper end of things that actually show up frequently, there's quite a lot of attacks that deal 60 poise damage to the player. So going for 61 poise total to protect yourself is also a good idea if you're willing to put more weight on. And in PvP, this is also a highly recommended save point. It lets you take a hit of Black Flame. And it also withstands three one-handed attacks, or two two-handed attacks, from a lot of medium-sized weapons, like straight swords and katanas. I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds of PvP here, but 31 poise is also a nice, lower amount of poise that's often recommended for defense against a bunch of weaker attacks. You can check the wiki for more thorough recommendations, but just a super quick and huge oversimplification, I might recommend 31 poise for some PvP, 40 poise if you're okay with the wolfering and nothing else, 46 poise if you're more PvE focused and want just a little more protection beyond the wolfering, and 61 poise for some sufficiently tankier PvP and PvE. And then if you don't want to overthink it, just throw on all the poise to crush the four kings in a DPS battle. But what sort of enemy attacks go beyond 60 poise damage? but you know, also aren't 999. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but here's a few examples. The Mimic has a couple attacks that deal 100 poise damage. And the Stone Guardian's wind-up attack deals 90 poise damage, but also that bigger, upward swing pulling the weapon back out of the ground deals 120. Then, with the following, we start hitting a guaranteed stagger, making me unsure of the point in setting this to something more specific than 999. The maximum poise you can have is 161, when you combine Havel's set with the Wolf Ring, and these are going to exceed that. For example, most of Calamite's attacks deal 300 poise damage. And the same goes for Artorius' jump attack. So whether it's 300 poise damage, or 999, or whatever, the poise damage is high enough that it makes sense that it'll always break your poise. But what about the notorious Torch Hollows and their running attack? You would assume there's massive poise damage here, but each hit from this attack is actually only dealing 5 poise damage. And with 4 hits total, that's only 20 poise damage at most. The Wolf Ring alone should have you covered here, but the Torch Hollows are simply cheating. You'll get staggered regardless, from literally any stage of attack within that animation. Your poise doesn't even actually have to break, which is incredibly strange. And when you remember that traps usually go through the process of breaking your poise legitimately, it's very weird that we have a guaranteed stagger that has nothing to do with poise. It turns out this is an alternate source of staggering, most commonly applied to enemies bumping you when they jump around. The ghosts are another enemy that can do the same thing as the torch hollow. Here I'm getting staggered regardless of poise, but this is only because I'm not cursed and haven't used a transient curse. In other words, once you can interact with the ghosts correctly, poise starts working against their attacks. And you might be surprised to hear that we're capable of doing this kind of attack as well. This is how our standard kick works. Our kick is guaranteed to stagger someone like Havel every single time, because it's also bypassing poise. This sounds great and all, but there is a catch. It's really only the player character who was designed to react to these sorts of attacks, and by extension this applies to most NPCs since they're built the same way as us. Now, we are able to kick around poiseless enemies as well, but I believe this is only because of how they made it possible to break the poise of zero poise characters, even when you're not dishing out real poise damage. The break flag is still being thrown for these enemies here each time they get kicked, so it's not being totally bypassed for them like it is with NPCs. But this takes us to everything else, everything that isn't a human NPC or a poiseless enemy. We can't ever stagger them with kicks. No actual poise is being drained, so it creates a surprising imbalance where the same kick that always staggers Havel will never stagger the Crow Demon, even if we do it a hundred times in a row. And bear in mind that this only applies to your standard kick. For any weapon that has a special kick attack that deals damage, those do have proper poise damage set as well. If you were wondering about stun locking, that's something that could be a whole tangent in and of itself, in terms of what's viable in PvP, but I just wanted to quickly review what makes it possible. Earlier I showed how when your poise breaks, a separate flag called break is turned on and changes from 0 to 1. And I said that when your poise breaks that it instantly refills, but that's only half true. Break will display as 1 during your entire stagger animation, and your poise doesn't actually refill until that animation is completed. If you take another hit during your stagger animation, you'll get stunned again and your poise will continue to stay broken during this time. 
Here we can see how this one hollow staggers me several times in a row. And we can see how it's caused by stun locking from breaking my poise just once, not actually several different times. This is one aspect where poise differs a little bit from how it works for enemies. For them, poise does instantly refill and you can't stun lock by hitting them a second time during their stagger. This is why it's a good idea in some cases to wait a little bit for your second attack, so you can time things better to ensure they're getting staggered as frequently as possible. Now, while talking about stun locking, I would be remiss not to mention toggle escapes. But this is a very complex topic that deserves its own discussion, so I'll probably make a separate video on it in the future. Just a very quick summary of it, stun locking can be a problem in that certain attacks have infinite stun locking capability. Like the hollow that just kept our poise broken, other players can do that to you in PvP, and they could hypothetically do it forever if they had infinite stamina, because the next hit of their combo will land before your poise becomes unbroken again. However, they included a means to escape stagger animations early. This is its own mechanic, and it was actually put in the game intentionally. It's not a glitch. The end result is that there's a whole strategy based around it in PvP, where people will change which weapon they're holding when they take a hit, just because that animation helps cut the length of the stagger animation short, allowing them to escape a stun lock. We're on this in a future discussion, perhaps, but just know for now that toggle escaping doesn't have anything to do with poise, beyond the ramifications of having your poise kept in that broken state. But from there, it's more about what can happen after the fact, with the stagger animation itself, which is a surprisingly deep tangent from here. And one last thing to mention here for stuff that ignores poise, but some animations that are sometimes described by the community as having infinite poise are just bypassing poise entirely as well. For example, there's backstepping through the boulder in Sense Fortress to get through it more easily. It's not that your poise wasn't really broken, because it was. It's just that this animation doesn't care. I suppose I should also talk about Iron Flesh. This is a pyromancy spell that also turns you into a tank, to an even greater degree than Poise itself. In addition to preventing flinching like Poise, it also adds a deflection effect to your character so that many enemy attacks will bounce off of you. But in order to prevent flinching, the spell isn't actually boosting your Poise. Instead, it's just sort of sidestepping the Poise mechanic. Here we can see how my Poise is still breaking with Iron Flesh cast. So what Iron Flesh is doing is it's invoking the same knockback prevention that Poise does, but it's doing it directly without working through the Poise system itself. The numbers associated with Poise still continue to drain as usual behind the scenes. We can see how it behaves the same way when taking one of the hits that normally sends you flying backwards. You still stagger, but you'll remain on your feet. Exactly the same as what happens when you have enough Poise for that same attack. Unfortunately, Iron Flesh doesn't stack with Poise. You might think that because each of these on their own reduce the severity of knockback, that they might allow us to prevent flinching entirely on these bigger attacks if we combine them. But that doesn't happen. It is worth mentioning that Iron Flesh does outperform Poise in some situations though. Remember all of those enemy attacks that were essentially a guaranteed stagger because their Poise damage was set really high? Because Iron Flesh is reducing the severity of knockback directly, these same attacks can finally be withstood with a minor stagger like as if you did have enough Poise. And one key difference is that Iron Flesh does also prevent the knockback effect built into the Torch Hollow's running attack. And everything I just said also applies to Havel's Great Shield. The effect from its special attack is doing all of the same things as Iron Flesh in preventing or mitigating your stagger, once again sidestepping poise instead of working through it. Earlier, I talked about the dependability of this poise system, but it also wouldn't be Dark Souls 1 if we didn't have some weird quirks and glitches to contradict me a little bit. If you're a fan of Ultra Great Swords, it's possible you've experienced enemies having their poise break with a little less predictability than I was giving this game credit for. There are some strong attacks that can deal a couple quick bursts of poise damage in quick succession. Earlier, I mentioned how the two-handed R2 of the Zweihander might deal 125 poise damage total because of its two smaller ticks of poise damage for 75 and 50 combined. But with the right spacing or angle of attack, it's possible that only one of those hits of poise damage will land. So for anything you see on the wiki that's broken up into something plus something else for a single attack, bear in mind that you might experience some inconsistent poise damage there. And here's another weird issue. The underlying poise damage originates from a fixed amount per weapon. When you see different amounts of poise damage for all of the different attacks, it's not that all of these were set individually. Rather, something like a katana is a weapon that deals 20 poise damage by default, 
then the higher numbers that are associated with two-handing or strong attacks comes from a multiplier that is applied to that original value of 20. Well, by some manner of weirdness, there are certain situations where this messes up a little, and something that should deal 32 poise damage might actually come up about 1 1 millionth short. So basically, this can lead to certain situations, particularly some running attacks, not breaking the exact poise you'd expect. So if you follow these numbers carefully, don't be too surprised when you find a few exceptions in PvP, where the breakpoint will essentially be one higher than you thought it was going to be. Shout out to this person for editing the wiki and including some more information on this. If you'd like to know more, I'll link to it below. Now, this next thing here is going back to something that isn't a glitch, but it's still a little strange and not remotely obvious to the player base. Earlier I said that the player character has ways of shortening the time it takes for their poise to regenerate, reducing it from the default of 5 seconds. The way this works is that there's a hidden stat called Correct Super Armor Recovery, and it's applied to every piece of armor that grants poise. In the parameters, you'll see a consistent minus 0.1 for all of these pieces of armor, so they all work the same as each other. But they're not subtracting a tenth of a second, instead that 0.1 refers to a multiplicative effect, where it's reducing the timer's length by 10%. So with one piece of poise armor equipped, your timer will change from 5 seconds to 4.5. But when you equip more, it stacks in such a way that it removes 10% from the most recent number. So the numbers start to get a little uglier here. Two pieces of poise armor equipped makes it 4.05 seconds, three changes it to 3.645 seconds, and four makes it 3.28 seconds. The wolf ring doesn't factor into this, so the timer will still be the full five seconds if you only have the ring equipped. But all four armor slots being equipped this way really does help a lot with allowing you to back off mid combat and getting your poise back quickly. With over a second and a half shaved off the timer, that's not insignificant. And this means the player character and NPCs can come in second place for fastest poise regeneration, second only to Artorias. And here's something else that's kind of funny. Rolling into enemies will trigger their timer without actually draining their poise. Instead of doing nothing, it's as if it registers a hit with zero poise damage, which is enough to count as a hit of some kind, allowing the timer to avoid running out its full 5 seconds. This is yet another reason why it's sometimes a good idea to roll through enemies' attacks towards them, rather than rolling away to get distance. By making contact with your roll, you're increasing the amount of time between your actual attacks where you can continue draining their poise. I also wanted to mention how there's other things that can knock you over, but don't have anything to do with poise. Take grab attacks, for example. Getting eaten by Mimic only reduces my poise by 30. But that doesn't really mean anything, because not escaping the grab means falling over at the end of the animation regardless. Whether you get out early without falling over or not depends only on if I mashed enough buttons during the grab attack. That's a separate mechanic and a topic that I might save for a future video, but honestly you can just watch this great video by Zuli the Witch that explains it all. Here's some additional quick commentary on where I think this version of Poise stands. I mentioned earlier that it's not uncommon for people to feel that this poise was overpowered in Dark Souls 1, which is fair, but I feel like most of that problem has more to do with how backstabs work in PvP rather than being an inherent flaw of poise itself. What a lot of players will do is equip a bunch of poise so that as they run into position for a backstab, it doesn't matter if the other player hits them. They won't flinch, and they'll be able to get into position for the backstab. These are known as poise backstabs, but if you're not a fan of them, I would argue the bigger issue is how easy it is overall to land backstabs in this game, and its lack of windup that the later games have. You could make the case that it's still overpowered in other ways for PvE, but what I like about Poison Dark Souls 1 is that having it work passively is really cool, and it justifies having heavier builds feel so slow and tanky compared to the later Souls games. The differences between light and heavy builds is much more apparent in Dark Souls 1, and I'm a fan of that. And the way it regenerates provides some consistency, so it's my personal favorite of the different poise systems in the series. I've wondered what nerfing it but remaining within the confines of this implementation might look like, and I can picture how just tweaking the existing numbers might satisfy a lot of its detractors. A slower regeneration that doesn't go too far like Dark Souls 2, but something more like an 8 second timer for the player character could actually go a long way in making it so it's harder to back off during PvP and get a full reset. It would be easy to make it so that previous hits don't clear up as quickly, and chipping away at an opponent's poise could be more viable for players who are a little less aggressive. So what do you think? Do you prefer the poise of Dark Souls 1 as it is? 
Would you like to see the same system kept, but simply nerfed a little? That's kind of where I fall. But if you prefer a different iteration of Poise, or if you have completely different ideas for it entirely, I'd also love to see some discussion on that in the comments below. There are pros and cons to each system, and it's understandable that someone might prefer the Poise from a different game. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I think I've said Poise so many times that the word has already lost all meaning. I'd like to thank Jester Patches for providing more info on the player character's recovery rates, and King Boar for getting to the bottom of the weirdness with the Chain Prisoner, and why the Torch Hollow's attack does what it does. If you'd like to support this channel, consider joining my Patreon, where I'm now making weekly posts every Wednesday. I might talk about what I'm working on, show things that didn't make it into an episode, or just post some random silly stuff. An extra special thanks to my backers at the Evil Vagrant tier. And until next time, really, I implore you to try poise taking the Capper Demon if you've never done it before. You will stop worrying about this enemy altogether, even without out-of-bounds cheese.